when I was going to Baylor University, I had the opportunity to go on a missions trip with our Assembly of God Church. And the missions trip, but there was two that was presented to me that summer. It was, uh, I was to either go, I can go to Detroit or I could go to Jamaica. So we already know what the Lord wants. Without even praying, we know it's Jamaica immediately. That's where God was leading. So I didn't even pray because I knew that it was going to be Jamaica that God was going to lead me to until I attended a conference in Fort Worth during our spring break. While friends were going to Galveston, Texas on spring break, I went back to Fort Worth where something happened that was life-changing to me. On the Thursday night, David Wilkerson was preaching. Gary Wilkerson was in the back, and David Wilkerson looked at this freshman at college and simply said, um, I want you to go with Gary to Detroit this summer. And immediately it was, when David Wilkerson says that, I mean, it's no to Jamaica is what that meant. And I ended up two months for a missions trip in Detroit that literally was going to become life-changing for me. Let me just pause for a second because I want to say something to the volunteers here. My job at that conference was doing nothing but shuttling people back and forth. I had a volunteer shirt on, and I would bring people back and forth to the airport. And it was there while I was volunteering that I discovered what God wanted me to do. That when you're not sure what God wants you to do, then serve. Just serve somewhere, whatever that is. What, I, I was driving my Toyota Celica and people to the airport not knowing that driving to the airport people would begin to land me an opportunity to go with Gary and Kelly Wilkerson to plant a church in Detroit. That's why I want to say to every one of you that are wearing a fire in our bones shirt and, and serving here, whether you're at the door, whether you're serving lunches, whether you're, I, I want to say thank you for what you're doing because that's how you find, really, I'm telling you, it's the serving is the quickest way to find what God wants you to do. If I could just jog your memory a little bit, David ends up on the battlefield with Goliath, not because he was known as an, an expert rock thrower. You ready for this? Read the story. He was delivering 10 cuts of cheese. He would, that's what it was. 10 cuts of cheese and bread, cheese sandwiches, and he said yes to cheese sandwiches. So I want to say those that are serving lunch out there, get ready. You have a, maybe have a Goliath coming to do something, but you serving can get you to where you need to be. So what happens is, is that that yes or that no for Jamaica became a yes to Detroit, and I would never miss an opportunity um, I say this is, as I don't know how many times I say it, I'm indebted to these two people. I'm indebted. I'm in the ministry today because of those two people. Because when I was done after two months, they asked me to stay. I would not be up here speaking to you if it wasn't for them seeing something in a young man. Um, now, almost 40 years ago is what they did. And it's always grateful for Gary and Kelly Wilkerson. And I didn't realize because then a second no was going to change my life. Because then they said, we don't want you to go. What they did was at 19 years old, I grew up in Assembly of God Church. I've, listen, folks, I, didn't, I never did drugs. I'm the last person to be in New York City or Detroit. I never was high. I never drank. I was a virgin till the day I got married at 33 years old. That, listen, that it, it should not be me pastoring. You, God should have got somebody like crazy, like Ron. But not me. He could have just did that. But not me. So, but God can use strange people to do what he needs to do. So Gary and Kelly have this great idea. And they said, let's put the 19-year-old kid in a prostitution hotel and lead a Bible study. So I knew three chords on the guitar, went down there at 710 every Thursday night because it had to start at 710 because they have to get their lottery numbers at 7. And then they'd come down with their stolen Gideon Bibles. And then we would go ahead and have a Bible study with all these pimps and prostitutes. But that's where they stuck me. And then they said to me, gave me another no. And the Gary and Kelly said no to going back to Baylor University. And they said, that's not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be up here. A no to Jamaica and a no to, to go back to Baylor University, look at me for a second, changed my life. Amen. Two no's. Amen. Two no's changed my life. Amen. 
And in fact, I want to take you on a journey because it was the Apostle Paul hearing not just two, but three no's is the reason why you're sitting here today. This church, your church, wouldn't exist if he didn't respond to his Jamaicas and Baylors. That there were three no's at the Apostle Paul, but it's the third no that literally was life-changing for me that I want to I want to share with you that, that changed the Apostle Paul. I have to just, if you get tired of me saying the Apostle Paul, it's because in New York, it gets a little raw sometimes. And, and so in our past, we've, I remember in, uh, in, in one of our, in our church, there was a, a guy that we would always keep saying Paul, and Paul said, and Paul did this. And some guy who's new to the faith just goes, I don't know who this guy Paul is, but you should invite him to the church because he, <laughs> he says a lot of great things. So I use the apostle Paul a lot just to remind them that we're speaking about Bible Paul. So... I want to talk to you for just for a few moments here, what I would call bad math. Bad math is what I want to talk to you about. I will get to the equation at the very end, but let me read to you a narrative from Acts chapter 16. You'll see the first two no's, and then we'll end with the final no. Um, And that's going to be the one I want us to focus on today. And then we're going to, at that moment, I believe God is going to do something special. Because this is going to be, I I, I just really sense it as I was praying this morning, like Gary was saying as he was praying, I really sensed this is what I was supposed to share. Acts 16.6, they passed through the Phrygian and the Galatian region, having been, here's the first note, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, verse 7. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the spirit of Jesus, second note, did not permit them. And passing by Mycenae, they came to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the, right, in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God called us to preach the gospel to them. So think of it for a moment. Paul heard no for the Galatian region, and Paul heard a no for Bithynia. Both those places are in Asia, and there'll be one more no at the end. Verse 11, this is when they get there. So putting out the sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, were suppo- where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. First convert coming up. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And it happened as they were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl came with a spirit of divination and met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. She was following after Paul and she kept crying out. This always just puzzled me. Listen to this. These men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Isn't that amazing that a demon possessed girl is telling the truth? That just because right words are coming out of someone doesn't mean someone's right because they're saying right words. I'll let you take care of that. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. But when her master saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought him to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming, we'll come back to this and make a comment, proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off, proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. They, they struck them with many blows. So rods, many blows, threw them into the prison. And if that's not enough, they commanded the jailer to guard them secure, securely. And then they threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to the stock. So this is, was the result of the deliverance of a young lady. Then finally, in these last few verses, many of you would be familiar with this. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, 
there came a great earthquake that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, the doors were opened, and their chains fell off. There's your three points for Sunday. The foundations shake, the doors open, and the chains fall off. That's what happened on that midnight hour. Chains broken, doors open, and foundations have, 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 have been shaken. And all this started with a man listening to the nose of not going to where he was planning to go. And we sit here at a conference in, the na- in our nation and nations around the world because of what this man heard. Let me explain. I want you to write down three things, but point number three is the most important. I'll get through this fast because I've got to get to point three. Number one, God is a father and fathers say no to their children. God is a father and fathers say no. Now, folks, hearing no is a test. It's a test of trust and it's a test of our obedience. Can you trust Authorities know that they may know better, especially when it's God who says no. But what makes the no even harder, don't miss this, is when it's no for a good thing. What do you mean? They were, they were being forbidden, it says in verse 6, they were being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. It was a good thing. And God says, no, you're not going to do that. God says no to speaking the word in Asia when speaking the word would be the thing. Jamaica was a missions trip for me, but God said no to a missions trip. And if Paul doesn't take God's no seriously, he never sees the vision of the man from Macedonia. If he goes to what his what was on his iCal, he never sees the man from Macedonia. The vision was given because he obeyed both of those no's. And as a result of that, that God then begins to give him this vision. The prerequisite to seeing God show up is obeying God when he speaks. And when God says no, It's calling for obedience. Now get this down. No is not rejection. No is protection. It's God protecting us from even ourselves, our agenda. It's when Gary hears no to the five messages he said he prepared for for, for this conference. And God goes, no, 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 no. Now you listen to what I'm going to tell you. That's what this is. Gary doesn't hear this the, to share with you from the book of Hebrews if he goes according to his own agenda. That no is not rejection. No is protection. And always remember, Satan always says yes. That's what the word Ouija board comes from. Ouija is made up of two words, a German and a French word, which both mean yes. It's Satan saying yes, yes. Should I stay home from church? Yes. Should I, should, should, should I no longer go to, yes. Should I date this man who's married? Yes. That's what he does. It's always yes with Satan. But because God is a father, fathers will say no. It's not rejection, but it's protection. And when he does say no, number two, get this down. When God does say no, it means he has something better for us. Whenever God says, God's a father, father say no. And when he does say no, it's because he sees something better. That's what this is all about. God is not simply exercising his parental power, but it's giving divine protection over our future. We know this as parents when we say no. We pray from the, right now, Cindy and I still prayed over our children, but when they were young, they would hear us pray these words over their life. From the moment they were born, Till, till schedules change with older kids. We'd pray three things over our kids. We'd go, God, protect their virginity. Keep them pure till the day that they get married. God, protect them physically, that no sickness, disease, harm, addiction, or danger ever come near their body. And God, protect their destiny. Let them be exactly who you've called them to be. 
We would start with the first one. We always go, God, protect their virginity. And they're little. They don't even know what that means. And we would just say, God, protect their virginity. Keep them pure till the day they get married. And let them marry a Christian. And fall in love once. And we would pray sometimes. No puppy love. Fall in love once with a Christian. And then we would say, God, protect them physically. Keep away any addictions, any cancer, any disease. Keep it away. Dog bites, bullets from where we were in Detroit. Keep them protected and then protect their destiny. Let them be exactly what you call called them to be. And I remember as we we're praying this, that I had one of the times I've exercised my parental no was right in the middle of it when our kids were young. When we were praying for them, they, my oldest daughter raised their hand, God protect their virginity, keep them pure till the day they get married, let them marry a Christian. And all of a sudden, my, at, she time, at that time she was five, she goes, I know who I'm going to marry. I said, hold on. I said, what are you talking about? She says, I know who I'm going to marry. And she pointed over to her brother. She said, I'm marrying him. I said, hold on, we're not hillbillies in this family. They're not married. You don't marry your brother. And what, the reason why she said that is because his name is Christian. She thought she has to choose a Christian, so he's the one that he knows. I just looked, I said, okay, prayer's over. You've ruined everything. Ichabod, go to bed. We'll start all over tomorrow night at this point. Pray for me. I've got really a difficult time with these kids. But what was bigger? What was bigger? What was bigger than preaching the word in Asia? God was thinking big. Remember, God is a father, and fathers say no. And when he does say no, it's because he's thinking of something bigger. What was he thinking at that time? Here it is. It's Acts 1.8, which is what his divine strategy was. This is what it says. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in where first? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, that's the region, and then to the uttermost or the end of the earth. Okay, stop there for a second. It, this is what God's plan was, as a three-part plan. One, we're going to come and we're going to begin to touch Jerusalem. But how was he going to do it? He was going to reach it by the day of Pentecost. I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit. Fire is going to come down and there is going to come an infusion, a baptism of power that will empower you, Peter, to stand in the city that you knelt down in to three people and denied me three times. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to stand where you used to kneel. You're going to preach where you used to deny. You're going to speak where you used to be silent. It was when I talked with Nikki Cruz, who's here, and I said, Nikki, what got you to where you were? And without, without even a pause, he said, it was not my, it was salvation got me, I was saved, but it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit that launched me into what God has called me to do. And that's what God did. He said, on this day of Pentecost, I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit in that upper room and there is going to come a fire that will begin to touch you. And I love the baptism of the Holy Spirit because what God does is it he starts with the gift of speaking in tongues. He says, I'm going to take the most untamed part of your body and I'm going to take that over and I'm going to begin to be in control of your life. Then he says, but we have to touch Judea and Samaria. That's Acts chapter 8. How does he do this? Listen to this. And on the day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That's part two. Except the apostles. And what happened when they were persecuted and scattered? Therefore, those who have been scattered went about doing what? He says, I'll use the power of the Holy Spirit to touch Jerusalem, but I'll use persecution to get you to Judea and Samaria. How in the world can God do that? Because that's God able to take what man thinks is going to stop the church. It actually grows the church. You're going to hear tonight from Mark Renfro. We were talking in our, our board meeting at World Challenge, and Gary had the CMO, the, the chief missions officer, share of what's happening. Think about this for a moment. Can persecution actually grow the church? You ready for this? The largest population of Christians in the world is China. Some of you thought the U.S. China. 
You can't even, it's illegal to be a Christian, and there are more Christians in China than even the United States, and you can't even have a church. But you ready for this? Do you know what the fastest growing church, the church in the world is? Iran is what Mark said. Folks, they say now, I started to read the book that you told us to, Too Many to Jail. They're getting saved too fast that they can't even put them in jail. And so here's what's amazing. What's incredible is this. Iran is the fastest growing church. This is going to mess you up. And there are no churches. You can't have a church in Iran. But that doesn't stop the church from growing. They said one, or Marx told us, and it's the, it, it was in the book, one out of every two Muslims that get, that get witnessed to are becoming to Christ. Folks, it's God saying persecution doesn't stop the church. It's one of God's strategies to grow the church. And he can do whatever he wants. So God goes, I've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit for phase one. I've got persecution for phase two. Don't miss this now. But now we're faced with part three. And Acts 16 was going to be the fulfillment of Acts 1.8. The gospel has to to go to the ends of the world and if Paul doesn't listen to God and stays with comfortable Asia then your church this church doesn't exist but thank God God is a father and fathers say no and when they do say no he sees something bigger and something better and that was the beginning you ready for this what Macedonia is and Philippi it's the first church in Europe that would eventually come to the United States and spread around the world that God said you're not going to stay in Asia but I'm going to send you to start the church in Europe at this time God is a father and fathers will say what It's not rejection, but what? And if he says no, it's because he has something what? But here's the third thing. Number three, jot this down. Better doesn't mean easier. Now we start. That was introduction. Here we go. One of the men that has influenced Gary's, Wilkerson, and Kelly's life and my life was a spiritual giant named Leonard Ravenhill, who said this, when God opens up the windows of heaven to bless us, Satan will open up the bowels of hell to blast us. When God opens up the windows of heaven to bless us, Satan will open up the bowels of hell to blast us. Heaven opened in Europe salvation to a woman who sells purple, deliverance to a little girl that would be delivered by demons, And then all hell blasts against them for doing because what they saw as deliverance, don't miss this, I'll let you enlarge it. What they saw as deliverance for someone's lifestyle, this girl was against the law of that time. And folks, that's what's coming today people that are getting delivered is going to be against the law and the customs and you're going to see all of a sudden from fines to jail time because we are we are going countercultural and going pro-biblical in what god wants to do in setting people free the deliverance that you thought should have brought celebration got them jail time and there they are in jail nobody else there And those are the hardest times. Hardest times is when all of a sudden you're going through it and there's nobody there to help. And you feel alone. You feel alone that you're going, God, I don't don't even know what to do. Before I came in here today, um, when just before Ron was was preaching, Kelly and 1121 were doing the worship, I had to go into a private room because I had to do a conference call, a teledoc call for blood work that they wanted to discuss the numbers with me of some things that that I had to do. So I had to work out the timing, the three hour difference and all that stuff. And when you're sitting waiting for that, boy, the enemy plays with your mind. And sometimes you're just going like, oh God, I need encouragement, I need it. And I'm sitting in this room like it's a jail cell going like, oh God, you gotta show up here. And I remembered my son 
when he was, one time I walked by his room one day and he was building something in there. The door was just barely open and I walked by and I heard this giant sneeze and he just went, ah, chew. And he looked around and he just goes, God bless me. And sometimes that's all we got is God bless. And I sat in that back room and I just go, God bless me. I need your presence. I need your Holy Spirit right now. I need the power of God to come. And God did show up. And this is what I want to talk to you about was this third no. Paul is in jail for doing the right thing. And at midnight they're singing hymns. And they're praying, and then at midnight, foundations shake, doors open, and chains start to fall off. Let me say that again. Foundations shake, chains fall off, and what's amazing is the doors opened up. Now get ready for the bad math in just a moment, because this is the third no that I need to talk to you about. Here it is. Listen now, leaders, listen. Listen. The cell doors open, here it comes, and they stayed. Are you serious? You're praying, earthquake, the doors open, and they stayed. Can I tell you, thank God it wasn't Paul and Tim Delina in prison that night. Because I would have just simply said, hey. Jehovah Jireh. God has opened up the doors. We, we're, this is what the next verse would say. Bye. And I'm out of there at that time. And for this reason, I've got scriptural precedence. Acts 12. Angel comes in, gets Peter out, and then you just go. But Paul has an earthquake. Chains fall off. The doors open. And he stays. What in the world is he doing here? Folks, listen to this. Here is bad math. This is for you. A tough situation plus an open door doesn't always mean it's God's will for you to leave. I knew you're thinking, going like, I knew we shouldn't have come to this conference. <laughs> here it is. Let me say it again. A tough and hard situation and an opportunity doesn't mean it's time for you to go. Okay, they, I, I heard a yummy sound over here, so let me just go over here. There's someone went, mmm. Okay, let me try this, because this, this area seems like you're really in trouble. So you have a tough situation plus an open door doesn't always mean we're supposed to go. Now listen. Because this is where it all happens, right here. Difficulty plus opportunity doesn't mean it's your way of escape. What was the hardest moment for Jesus on the earth? It's when he's hanging between heaven and earth and says these words, my God, my God. What's the rest of it? Why has you forsaken me? Now, here it is. When Jesus felt furthest from God, he was in the center of God's will, redeeming the planet back to himself. Amen. Did you hear that? Yes. When Jesus felt furthest from the Father, he was in the center of God's will. When it became the hardest, God goes, you're exactly where I want you to be. Okay, jot this down. You have to hear this. Difficulty is not directional. Difficulty is not directional. Jacob says these words. He says about this Laban. He says, Laban has changed my wages 10 times and has cheated me. But he never left in those 20 years because of what was happening to him. He left because God spoke to him. When God spoke to him and said, rise up and go back to Bethel. We are people of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Holy Spirit. And folks, listen to me. You're not going to want to hear this, but difficulty is poor providence. 
It's not how we base our walk. We live by the voice of God. We live by the voice of the Holy Spirit. And folks, let me just tell you, get this down now. Difficulty is not directional, but difficulty will deepen and mature. When you stay, because God hasn't led us on, when you stay, it deepens and matures. I was reading the story of the, of the great British scientist, Russell Wallace, who was doing experiments with the emperor butterfly. And he did something that was astounding to me. He said he watched one of those butterflies with those magnificent colors and wings. And he said he watched them struggle from the cocoon to get out. And the struggle was massive. And what he did was he said, I took a pen knife and I opened up the cocoon so there was no more struggle. And he said, but what I didn't know is what the struggle did was get the mucus off their wings and begin to show the color, the beautiful color. And what happened was when I pulled them out, I relegated them to crawling and never flying again. That there are moments that you're thinking, I can't do this. And God is scraping off mucus to say, I need to get junk off you in this. I don't need you to cut open one of those big things because you went on monster.com or because you got some new job that's going to come and go, this is going to be easier. And God goes, you don't have any idea. I'm getting stuff off you to get you ready for what you're supposed to do is what God does. Now, here it is. Now, folks, listen to this. Here it comes. If Paul and Silas leave the church in Europe, three things doesn't happen. Here it comes. If the church in Europe doesn't start because when he leaves, all of a sudden, he walks out. And now he leaves behind the very converts that are going to be part of this church. He's thinking to himself, wait a second, here it comes. One, we can start a church here. I've got Lydia. She could be in charge of hospitality. Everybody in purple. And then we got a demon girl that just got saved. Children's ministry. And then all of a sudden... We need a deacon, that's the jailer that has to get saved. But folks, he wasn't just going to be the deacon, don't miss this now. But God was going to do something because Paul stayed, a church starts, and you get to pastor. You're not pastoring because of the assemblies of God or the Presbyterian or the church in God in Christ. You're pastoring because a man in Acts 16 obeyed the Holy Spirit. That's why you're here today. So when you go back to your roots, listen, I was born and raised in Pentecost. But when you go back to your roots, don't go back to Azusa Street. Go back to Acts 16. That's when it started. Right there. That's when the church started. So here it comes. When the church starts, he goes, okay, I've got these three people. But listen to this. Because God then says, if you stay when it's difficult, I'm going to use the guy, here it comes, that put the wounds on you to wipe those wounds clean for you. Look at it. Acts 16. Here it comes. And he took them that very hour of the night, this is the jailer, and washed their wounds. And immediately... He was baptized and his entire household. Folks, look at me. Some of you are going to places with wounds because you didn't stay long enough for the people that put them on there could be the very people that washed them and bring healing back to your life. But as you're running from church to church, wounded, trying to preach while you're wounded, God goes, no, 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 stay. I'm taking mucus off you, and I'm going to use the people that put the pain there to eventually become to bring the healing into your life. Now listen, if Paul leaves, there's no church. If Paul leaves, there's no healing of the wounds. And finally, if Paul leaves, think about this. They're in Philippi. If Paul leaves... And you can't say things like this. For I am confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in me will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ. 
That's Philippians 1.6. If Paul leaves, you can't say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because that letter was written to that Philippian church. If Paul leaves, you can't say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If Paul leaves, you can't quote Philippians 2.11 that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. If you, if Paul leaves, you can't say, forgetting what lies behind, reaching what's ahead, I press on to the goal of the prize of the high calling of God. And if Paul leaves, you can't say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Thank God he stayed that night in that jail. Thank God he stayed. As Jared and the team come, let me close with this. None of those verses exist if the two guys leave the cocoon. Tough season. This is bad math. A tough season plus an open door doesn't mean God wants you to leave. Someone out of a church, someone out of Christianity, some may want out of a marriage. Some may even want out of life. And I'm telling you, by the authority of the scriptures, stay put. Stuff is coming off you. And the people that put the wounds may be the very ones that heal the wounds. And verses and letters need to be written that never would have been written if Paul leaves. Wounds would never be healed that could have been healed if he stays. I don't even understand to a certain degree, I don't understand how the prisoners stayed. That's, that's an anomaly to me. I understand Paul and Silas because they're listening to the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says these guys weren't looking at the Lord. They were looking at Paul. They were watching them saying, I don't know what they saw, but somehow they stayed. However, however many convicts were there, they stayed. Because Paul says, we're all here. Don't do yourself any harm. Because if he loses Paul and any of the prisoners, then he has to kill himself because he's going he's to be relegated to death. But somehow God kept them all there. I have to believe there was a bunch of ex-cons in the first church in Europe. I have to believe it was the safest church in Europe at that time. These were the Mau Mau's that were taking the offerings at that time. The Nikki Cruises that's shaking the offering baskets. The richest church at this time because you had the ex-cons all in that church. They saw something. Let me tell you this final story. Two hours away, a few years ago, there was pastor, one of the great, not just pastors, but one of the great speakers, was one of the, was the bishop and the presider over the Church of God in Christ, Charles Blake, at West Angeles Church of God in Christ. I was speaking in... I was speaking in Springfield and had the privilege of, of speaking at a conference that Bishop Blake was speaking at. And I was, I was in a main, I was doing a workshop. He was one of the keynote speakers. And my goodness, could that man speak. He's retired now. His son's leading West Angeles Church of God in Christ. But oh my goodness, to hear Bishop Blake. And only Bishop Blake could talk about this, this in Bishop Blake fashion. Bishop Blake took Acts 16 and in his, he looked at us, he looked at, at the congregation and said, he goes, Paul and Silas were in prison. It's midnight and as they sang, their song, this is what he said, he goes, started to go into the atmosphere. I 
said, that's not in the Bible. I said, I can't even see that. And then he goes, it went to the stratosphere. I'm going, he must be reading the message because this thing doesn't say, there's no way this says. He goes, it went from the atmosphere to the stratosphere to the ionosphere. I didn't even know about that one from, from school. And then he said, until that song settled in heaven. And he goes, and in heaven that day, God the Father was listening to cherubim and seraphim saying to him as Kelly and the team let us and he kept going he was saying holy 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 thrice holy and you know if you say thrice that's good and he just goes thrice holy and he said and all of a sudden God the Father goes stop I hear us music and he said, cherubim said, yes, Father, it's us. Holy, I stop. This music's coming from Europe. He said, it's coming from a jail cell. And Bishop Blake said, God got happy that night. He said, and God started tapping his foot. But God forgot that the earth is his footstool. And as he's tapping his foot, the earth shook. The foundation shook. The doors opened up and the chains fell off. And they stay. They stay. They stay. Hallelujah. Stand with me. How many need God to tap his foot? <laughs> I need some foundations to shake. I need some chains to fall. And I need some doors to open. But God, I'm not moving unless you tell me. To move. I'm staying until I hear your voice. Two quick thoughts, and then I'm going to invite you to come for those that are just going, I need staying power. Staying power. Jared, my mom just died recently. We just did the memorial service. She's 101. She was, let me tell you something. Nikki was there, did the memorial service. So it was Gary. Pastor Carter and Marvin Winans just spoke because they knew my parents so well. And that woman was amazing. She was amazing. And God gave us, I mean, 101 years. That woman, she would get her hair done every Saturday just to go to church. You call it the beauty parlor at that time. You go to the beauty parlor, get it. She wore high heels every day. I mean, she was just an amazing prayer warrior. And it hit me, because in my difficult times, when I, the hole that I was always looking for to get out was the hole that my dad would open up for me sometimes. I had three moments in my life that became very difficult that I wanted out. I wanted out. And I realized when we buried my mom, my dad's been dead since 2000. My mom just passed away and I realized at 60 years old I just became an orphan I'm an orphan and three times in my life my dad tried to open up the cocoon hole and he said these three words he just said just come home just come home and I knew I couldn't hear those words anymore because I don't have any more parents the, la the next time the only person that could say these words to me now is God the Father when my time is done he's just going to go just come home just gonna, and folks, I'm ready. I'm telling you that right now. I'm ready. If I hear those words, just come home. You won't have to tell me that twice. But in those moments, I can tell you, it was your song. I have a playlist here on my phone. And it just, I, for some reason, I don't know why, I called it emotional. 
And when I realized Jared was playing last year, I got a little starstruck. I, made, I asked him if I can have a picture with him and everything. You can't see this. He's rolling his eyes right now. <laughs> and his song, Lord, I'm Amazed by You, it held me when I wanted to walk out. It held me when, I, when God was saying, stay, because I'm going to deepen you. Stay. Just, just don't, don't think, I'm going to take mucus off. Stay. I've got a church to build. I've got letters that need to be written. And I've got wounds that need to be healed. Let me say that again. Stay. I have a church that's going to get built. I have wounds that are going to get healed. And I have letters that have yet to be written. Stay. Because he's building a church. Stay. Because wounds are going to be healed. Stay. Because letters have yet to be written. And he wants to come and do that. Father, we declare there's a church to be built. There's wounds to be healed. And there's letters to be written. And you're going to take these amazing men and women that have just prayed at midnight sung at midnight and now Father we're asking that the mighty work of the Holy Spirit they would leave here there may be every one of them are joining with us on stage we all have wounds we all have stripes blows to the back but God on this day we stay put and we Declare, we will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Come on, tell him right now. Just say, I will listen to your voice. I will listen to you. When you say no, it's no. And when you say go, I go. Make us all sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Yeah.